Good evening. Somebody reminded me of something I said a handful of Wednesdays back and referencing to you guys as the Wednesday Night Warriors. Out here in the middle of the week, battling kind of the middle of the week, yeah, you know, among other things, but tired, but the Lord is worth it to come and hopefully be refreshed and not eat too much pork, I guess, but <laughs> other things go along with that. So we'll be in Genesis 20, or Genesis, Numbers chapter 23 tonight, we'll keep plugging away through Numbers. Some good stuff when it comes to Balaam, and as we looked, it's something that uh, the Lord draws from throughout the Scriptures, virtually from cover to cover, from Numbers to Revelation, the Lord would point back to this guy and this piece of history, the error of Balaam, it would refer, be referred to several times. It's easy to get caught up in error, getting something wrong. There was a lady one time, and she said, you know, to kind of really fix my husband, I'm going to tune him up. I'm going to give him the silent treatment. And, and she did for about a week. And towards the end, about the end of the week, the husband remarked that, hey, we sure have been getting along good lately. <laughs> Sometimes we step into error, you know, whether it be either one of the, those cases, either one of the people in that, that case. Sometimes, you know, we just... The error of Balaam. <laughs> oh, the foolishness continues. Balak, the guy who hired Balaam to curse this people, worried about the nation of Israel coming in. There must be a way to curse them, he would say. There's got to be a way to rob them of their spiritual power. A way to get at them. Some way, some angle to make this work. There's got to be a a missing piece in their armor. There's got to be a way to get in there. And he's going to find that the way that they try spiritually is just not going to work. So, you know, from Balak's thinking, and as he hires Balaam, he's, you know, he's thinking, you know, there's these guys, you know, they're, they're just people. Obviously, they've sinned. Obviously, they've messed up. There's got to be a way in there. There's got to be a way to position ourselves or to petition their God in order for him to curse them. How can he be totally pleased with them? How can there not be a way that we can be more pleasing to him to get him to do that? How can we manipulate the situation? And that's so interesting. And I, I love that about the love and the promises of God. That he can bless you, that he can call you, that he can cover you, and that in that, there is no way that the enemy, there is no soothsayer, there is no weapon fashioned that can touch you. And they're going to find that out the hard way, that, that in Christ, that in the Lord, in his promises, he can take a person like Lot and say, righteous. That in the Lord, he can take someone like David and says, he has, he's a man after my own heart, and I said he's righteous. That they're going to look down on this nation, that they're going to look for the different ways, and they're going to find out that they are protected and covered and blessed by God. Not because of their power or might, but because of the faithfulness and, and the blessing of God. So, we just, I, for me, I just see the beautiful, just one more facet of the beauty in God demonstrating to us that, that the curse fell on Christ. And we'll look in Galatians later at that. That the judgment, that the curse, that these things can't come out against us because God placed on him the iniquity of us all and he has said, Righteous, you are, you're sanctified. You're now in a place where you can't be touched by those things anymore because of what already occurred. And they're not going to, they're going to learn that Balak and Balaam and the princes, and it's going to be demonstrated to us, that it wasn't about their 
pursuit of this other spiritual power or earthly position even. We'll just get in a higher place. We'll come at it from another vantage point. But it's about position spiritually to the Lord. So, Numbers chapter... Actually, we're going to start in chapter 22, the very last verse, verse 41. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered a bull, a ram, on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. And God met Balaam and said to him, I have prepared the seven altars. I have offered each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. So here are the princes, and, and Balak are, are standing there and say, Hey, you know, what are we going to get for our money? What's going to come of this? What's going on? There's this time of sacrifice and preparation. And we're going to see the Lord use Balaam. And that really totally, I guess, shouldn't totally surprise us, given the fact that he used a donkey in the last chapter. It kind of sets us up with, it's okay, I, I can use whatever I want, and whomever I want, whenever he wants, because he's the Lord. He could use Pharaoh to, to, to give a dream. He could use the high priest Ananias, who was not a follower of Christ and not a saved man. He could use him to prophesy. God can use whom he wants and how he wants. And in context, we see that it certainly is not because Balaam is a godly man. So in this, as we before we continue on, um, because this maybe should kind of be like nails at a ch on a chalkboard to see God use Balaam a little bit here. Because in verse 23 of this chapter, and we'll see elsewhere, a little bit we get a little more description of, the, of what Balaam is doing with these sacrifices and the altars. Because it doesn't have anything to do with the Old Testament sacrifices that we've been learning about. This was something different. And I, I want to kind of deal with it a little bit more now. Um, in verse 23... Talks about any divination that comes from Israel against Israel. That divination, that word, is translated soothsayer in Joshua. It's the same word that's used for when the the witch that Saul goes and sees in uh, oh, where is that? First Samuel. So it's used there as well. First um, Samuel twenty-eight eight. It's also used of practices that the false prophets that Jeremiah and Ezekiel come up against also used in, in 2 Kings. So it was this thing that had to do with oftentimes they would, they would look at omens. And of course it's going to get beyond my ability to pronounce. So A-U-G-U-R-Y is one term that's used to describe this. So basically they would take entrails, guts, or different things, and they would look and, and determine from how they laid out what, what the will or what destiny or what was supposed to happen. They would oftentimes use livers, smoke, oil and water birth defects, and say, oh, this means this, and they'd move on. So this was the type of practices that were common to that area and common with this word that's used to describe what they were trying to bring against the nation of Israel. And so it seems weird that God would have the grace or God would choose to work in this. You know, I mean, it's weird when, when Saul went to the witch in Endor and God interrupts it and actually brings Samuel up. Why he chooses to do that sometimes, I don't know. We know from context, it's not be, Balaam is clearly stated as a false prophet by the New Testament. 
and by the situation. But God chooses to do this because he's teaching us not only about Balaam and for the church, as we saw last week, but he's also going to teach us about his care for his people, and he's going to use Balaam to do so. So they're going to ascend the heights of Baal. So they're going to dig into this spirituality that they believe has power. They're going to take a physical position to look or superiority to look at the nation of Israel to observe them. And they're going to see what will come of it. How do we get this advantage to attack this nation, this people? Verse 7. So this prophecy, this word that the Lord's going to give Balaam to speak, even though he was paid to curse him, he's going to bless him. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? From, for from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, set apart. Not reckoning itself among the nations who can count the dust of Jacob. Or number, number one-fourth of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous. And let me end... Let my end be like this. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? So we see this first in a series of prophecies by Balaam. <laughs> and I think Balak's reaction had to be with fright. I mean, because he was already freaked out that here comes this nation and they just whipped up on, on the Amorites who had, who had beat them up. They'd come out of Egypt. God had been supernaturally blessing and helping them and they're at their door and so they sent for Balaam, help us out. And now their help that was going to bail them out of this situation that thought was imminent doom... Here comes blessing. Oh, whoops. <laughs> that didn't help at all. So he's freaking out. He's a little stunned. I thought we saw what was supposed to happen here. We, we made those sacrifices on the high places of Baal, and, and this is what happened. We were in the place of superiority. And now I'm worse off than before. So they see up from there, we see in verse 9 there, that as they look down at the nation of Israel, they see a nation set apart. Not among the nations. And so they could see that, that obviously many of the nations didn't dwell directly with each other. They were oftentimes some distance be, from each other. So this, is, this statement is something more than, hey, they're, you know, they're four miles from us rather than the usual nation that's two miles from us. This, this speaking about they were set apart, they were sanctified, they were different than everyone else. God had given them his law to walk it out, but he separated them when he called them out from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. He blessed them. They were set apart and blessed. And we see, we see this principle with this set apart nation that whom God has blessed, they're not going to be cursed. Not going to happen. Can't happen. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the origin of this nation, Israel, this man Abraham that God was going to make into a nation, in chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, he says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you, or I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse the, him who curses you. 
and in all the families of the earth, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Fact. Done. This nation was blessed. And again, as we'll get into later in chapter 25 particularly, not that they couldn't have parental discipline or correction, but there was no more condemnation. There's no more, they're not, they can't be cursed like that anymore because they've been sanctified. They've now been set apart. And Israel, of course, being set apart by the blood of the Lamb. That would show us a pattern that we are called and separated out of the world. Even though we're in the world, we're a separate people. Us too, by not the blood of a lamb that you put on your doorpost, but the blood of the lamb that we put on the doorpost of our heart. So Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. I just want to read that just as we kind of bring it a little closer to home. We know as a nation that that promise stood from God. But God has recorded this and kept this for us that we might learn. That we might grow and draw near to the Lord. So Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. For as many as are the works of the law under the, law, under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things, which are written in the book of the law, to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so this isn't just about the nation. This isn't just recorded in the Old Testament. But these are things that we draw from because we, we step into this blessing. We step into this sanctification also. That as we have an enemy that would like to curse us, that as we had a handwriting and requirements that were against us, that were nailed to the cross, taken out of the way. We begin to draw some of that out and reminded of those things from these prophecies. And so that it wasn't to be moved and to not be cursed wasn't just about physical position. Because here we find ourselves still maybe at the same job or maybe still in the same life. How is this possible? I still feel like some days that the enemy's just thumping me. But that we see that it is spiritual in position. See, they thought they could ascend to the heights of Baal and look down and that that would make some kind of difference. But it was in position towards God that made all the difference. And us, he has taken us positionally and made us sons. No longer foreigners, no longer strangers, no longer away from the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians chapter 2 would say, but now have been brought near by His blood. So they are blessed and sanctified and given the Word of God to live by. But ultimately we see in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 7, that He did it because He loved them. Not because they were great, not because they could overcome all the enemies, but He, he just loved them. And He said, hey, why don't you believe my promise and I'll call you out based on the blood of the Lamb and follow my word. We can do that. We can do that. But they would also be fruitful and in that God would be glorified. They would become like the dust of the air, like this dust cloud. And so too, Jesus told us that our Father is glorified that we bear much fruit. <laughs> Blessed, sanctified, justified, glorified. We see a lot of things popping up that we also see pop up in our life. Romans chapter 8, and we'll probably, we'll probably come back to that just because maybe I'll finish with that. Such a good 
set of verses. So now Balaam was like, wow, there at the end of his little prophecy, the end of verse 10, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. And in the middle of all this, he, you know, he's just like, wow. Look at their destiny. Look at their relationship to God. It was something to be desired. But like too many and too often, the desire to have the, the death or the life, if you will, of a righteous person doesn't always go along with the living. doesn't always go along with the desire to live it. A lot of people want to get to heaven, but they don't want to receive the righteousness of Christ. They don't want to give him their life. Balaam could look down and say, wow, let me die a death of the righteous. Let me have an end like this. But in the end, he would prefer gold and silver and the ways of the enemy. I think it, I, as I just was looking at this, it just felt me, I, it felt like a lot like perhaps maybe Judas to walk and maybe see and be able to even maybe even speak the words of truth as he would go out and, and in the end would trade it for something so futile. The error of Balaam, the New Testament would say. Greedy gain. To be able to look and say, wow, man, I want that. But not as much as the coin. Tragedy. He wanted a destiny like theirs, but exchanged it. Verse 13. <clears throat> Then Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only the outer part of them and shall not see them all. Curse them for me from there. So he brought him to a field of Zephim, to the top of Pishgag, and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, Stand here. By your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak, and thus you shall speak. So he came to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offering. And the princes of Moab were with him, and Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? Let's try a different view. Let's try a different angle. We see that Balak's protest and his money came to nothing, really. It, didn't, it was to no avail. So let's try something new. I don't know if I can help myself. I found it a little bit like Mike Bloomberg's campaign. <laughs> Let me try a different slogan. I'll throw more money than anyone in the history and then maybe have the shortest campaign. <laughs> I don't know. I, anyways. I thought it was funny and I couldn't resist. So. so he tries to throw more money at it. Let's try a different angle and it all comes to nothing. 